How's everyone doing this morning? Who's excited? All right, that's awesome. Very cool. Uh, well, thank you, Maggie, for that uh, awesome introduction. Um, so my father's father, uh, uh, Edward was his name, he, uh, he actually had a, a dream, which was to give his family a better life. And he uh, grew up in the West End of Boston and grew up in hardship. His father uh, was an alcoholic, worked uh, three jobs, and served in the Korean War, came back, and, and, and his dream was for his children to have a better life. And that dream was realized when my father was the first in the family to graduate from college. And my father wanted to, um, he, he really loved ecology and learning about the living world. And at, at one point, uh, he realized that that wasn't enough, that just, just using his intellect wasn't enough, and that he actually wanted to make a difference, and he wanted to use his heart as well. And so his vision was to make a difference in the lives of kids around the world. And he's now uh, moved on to, to do some really important work with international nutrition. And so I've been inspired by my dad's story and thinking, how am I going to, what what's my role going to be in this, in this world? So I was always curious as a kid. I would lie uh, awake at night wondering just why is there poverty? Why is there war? I remember one, uh, one night um, imagining that uh, I had a friend, uh, Marco, in, in um, elementary school. His name, his name was Marco. He's from Bolivia. And I imagined what would it be like if we ever found that our nations were at war what, and, and we encountered each other on, on a battlefield? What would that be like? And I imagined that we would see each other and we would recognize each other. We hadn't seen each other in maybe 15, 20 years and we would just realize how stupid war was and we would put down our weapons and we would hug each other. And that's how I, I imagined what would happen. Um, so I went into the world wondering how to take these values into, into my life, um, how to bring people together, how to make the world a better place. When I was in college, I, I really wanted to understand why. Why is the world the way it is? Um, so I traveled around New York State learning about migrant farm workers and the injustices they face and lack of pay, poor working conditions. I learned uh, traveling in, in Brooklyn and working in Brooklyn for a summer at a community organizing agency in low-income African-American, Hasidic-American, Caribbean-American housing projects. And I learned that injustice is there, too. I, I lived on a farm in Costa Rica for a summer. It was a pineapple farm. And the, well, I learned that all of the pineapple that was being grown was shipped to the United States for export. And what used to be on that farm was a rainforest. In fact, 90% of the rainforest in the village where I was had been cut down so they can uh, create these export farms. So when I graduated from school, like many of you will, I had no idea what I wanted to do. I, I just want, I had so much energy and excitement and because of my experiences I thought that I would, because I wanted to make a difference in a community somewhere, that I would join the Peace Corps. And uh, I was all set to go. I met with the recruiter until one fateful night in the Brooklyndale Community Center uh, in, in Caroline when the deputy town supervisor of Ed Cope, uh, his name was Ed Cope, came up to me and said, hey Dominic, you can't leave. Your community needs you here. Would you consider running for town council? And how many people have ever thought of running for office? Raise your hand. OK, a few. Excellent. Um, well, like the vast majority of the rest of you, I was like, absolutely not. No way. Why would I ever want to do that? That's something adults do. That's not for me. But then when I thought about it, I realized that maybe I can choose to pursue the aspiration I had as a child, not overseas in another country, but maybe I can be, uh, build community, bring people together, make a difference, be a change agent right in my hometown in rural upstate New York. And so I chose to stay. And I uh, ended up knocking on hundreds of doors, going around talking with uh, hundreds of people, and out of four people running, ended up being uh, the highest vote getter and was elected to office at the age of 22. And since then, I've learned that my story is actually just one of many stories in this room. Um, 
from from Zach Berger, who came here to the, uh, you, you know his story, he came here, he saw a bunch of adults talking about climate change, and he's like, what? You're talking about climate change, but that's going to be my future that you're talking, that's my future you're talking about. We as young people need a voice. And so he chose to work with the Wild Center, and now you're all of here living in his, uh, in, in the legacy of that choice that he made at that one, at that one moment. Um, Luis, who uh, is the sustainability director, and uh, decided it's not enough just for her to work on campus. She has to uh, actually build this uh, clean energy economy and build this local food economy, and so started her own farm. And is, her vision is now to provide uh, food for her community. And uh, in the back, Chris, uh, whose brother came here before and uh, told stories, and he was so excited uh, to come here that, uh, that he's here now, and he went to the environmental club and went to every single meeting, and now wants to take what he's learning here and bring it back uh, to the school to, to work with Michael on composting and um, to make some really cool things happen. And so all of our stories, each of us here is, is on a hero's journey that led us here today. And together, all of our stories are part of a larger story of a generation coming of age at the start of the 21st century. We're the largest generation in history. Half the world is under age 25. And we're the most open-minded generation in history, the most tolerant, the most traveled, the most mobile, technologically savvy, and interconnected generation in history. And I'm so grateful to be alive at this time when we have such a rich and diverse, abundant and majestic world. But we all know that we're waking up uh, at a critical moment, at converging crises, ecological, cultural, social, political, spiritual crises. In fact, it's been said that we are the middle children of history, coming of age at the crossroads of civilization, a generation rising between an old world dying and a new world being born. We are the make it or break it generation, the all or nothing generation, the crucible through which civilization will pass or crash. That was Joshua Gorman who founded an organization called Generation Waking Up. So that brings us to this present moment. Oh, yeah. So that brings us to this present moment where we see that our consequences for the first time in human history are extending beyond just our own lives or even 200 years, but even into geological time. And what we do now will determine quality of life on this planet for millennia and possibly millions of years to come. No pressure. OK. <laughs> All right, so now we need to know, but in order to, to make the world a better place and to take action, we need to know where we are now. And so you're all here because of our changing climate. And you all know this, but our climate change, this is not, this is not new. Um, we've known about it for decades. And uh, what are, just shout out, what are some of the impacts uh, of climate change that we're already seeing? Glacier. So that I can hear you. Glacier. Glaciers are melting. Sea levels, sea levels are rising. Oh, Crazy yeah. weather, increased rainfall. Increased. Wind storms. Wind storms. Drought. Drought. Epic drought, unprecedented drought. 12% of the U.S. is in exceptional drought, the highest classification that there is. Um, we're also seeing bleaching coral reefs, and we're seeing worsening storms, unprecedented flooding, and it appears to be accelerating as well. We used to think uh, 20 years ago that climate change, or even five, 10 years ago, climate change was a grave but distant threat. We didn't have to worry about it with some remote future, but it's arrived 100 years ahead of schedule. And that we and we will be facing the impacts in our lives throughout our lifetime. Well, why? Why? Why is this? Well, fundamentally, it's because of the the science that that we used to think that the atmosphere was so vast and huge, but actually it's so thin, um, and it, we're easily able to tip it out of balance by changing the chemical makeup. Uh, we think of it as this huge, vast thing, but actually you can fit 
266 atmospheres in the ocean. The ocean is 266 times larger than the atmosphere, and we already know that we're changing the chemical composition of the ocean. I know, it's crazy. <laughs> so it shouldn't surprise us that we can easily change the chemical composition of our atmosphere. Okay, this is the most, how many people have seen this graph? Maybe 10% uh, of people. Okay, this is the most important graph you will ever see in your entire life. Get ready. All right, so on the top you see CO2 concentrations going up and down. Uh, the time scale is zero over on the right to 400,000 years uh, over where I'm on the left. And on the bottom you'll see temperature going up and down. So when it's down, that's uh, an ice age. When it's up, um, that's an interglacial period. So what are some things that you notice about this graph? Temperature follows CO2. They're highly uh, related or correlated. What else? There's a sequence. It's a cycle. It's a kind of a regular pattern. Cool. What else? I say, yep. Uh, yeah, one, actually one interesting thing to know is that the blue, the blue graph on the bottom uh, that it takes a while actually, it's kind of slow for it to go down to that glacial period, but when, when, it, when it goes from interglacial, to, sorry, from glacial to the warm interglacial, it, phew, it just shoots right up. It melts really quickly is one way to think about it. Uh, other things to notice, uh, it's, um, that there are certain tipping points perhaps when it gets to the bottom, all of a sudden something rapid changes in it and it travels back up. It's non-linear is the term. It's not smooth. It changes rapidly and unexpectedly. Um, another thing to notice is the CO2 level, the top one. Notice how it's never gone above 300 parts per million. That's parts per million carbon dioxide equivalent in the atmosphere for the last 400,000 years. In fact, it's been that way for several hundred thousand years beyond that. Um, <clears throat> Another thing to notice, and this is, the, uh, this is the kicker, down at the very end of the uh, blue graph, you'll see it kind of levels off a little bit. Do you see that? Um, the time scale of that is, uh, sorry, is 10,000 years. What happened in the last uh, 10,000 years? Who can say? Civilization. Civilization. Farming. Farming. Agriculture. End of the, last ice age. the end of the last ice age. So. <laughs> The, yep. All, basically, all of human history happened within that amount, in that tiny little span. And that's, isn't that amazing that the only time in this whole graph where it was actually level, the temperature was level, where the, sea, the seas were stable, or the temperatures were stable, was just in the last 10,000 years. And that just happened to be where we, we weren't having to chase back and forth, or chasing away, running away from glaciers, or we could settle on the edges of uh, lakes and oceans without being, uh, having to move back and forth. That's how agriculture developed. That's when our cities developed. All of human history ca was contained and human civilization was made possible by that stable climate. So when we're talking about our changing climate uh, affecting civilization, this is, this is why we're talking, talking about. Okay, um, so <sighs> never, abo never before has it gone above 300 parts per million uh, CO2 in the atmosphere. Uh, that was before the Industrial Revolution. Does anyone know where we are now? That's right, 392 and rising fast. It's higher than it's ever been in the last two million years. Um, but do you know where we will be with another 40 years of burning car carbon dioxide or burning car uh, fossil fuels and releasing CO2 in the atmosphere? Where we will be? By the way, this is your and my lifetime. 770 parts per million, even with a 15% global cut in emissions. 770 parts per two, 770 parts per million CO2 in the atmosphere. The last time there was that was 33.9 million years ago at the end of the Eocene when there was no Antarctic ice sheet on the planet. Whew. So. Um, the next few years actually will determine the quality of human life on this planet uh, for several millennia, uh, perhaps several million years. They found that carbon emissions are essentially irreversible on a human time scale. 
And even if we were to cut emissions to zero today, that we will have already we will already have some uh, changing climate built within the lifetime built into the pipeline. And we know that the impacts, the ice actually started melting at 300 parts per billion, and the coral reef started bleaching at 320. So we're, we're already well along in this process. Um, but it gets even more fun than that. Climate change is not the only challenge that we're facing uh, based on our fossil fuel economy. Um, in fact, we face many challenges. Uh, what are some other challenges that, that we face? Supplies of fossil fuels. What else? The cost. The cost. What, what are some other crises that we're facing on this, uh, challenges that we're facing at this time? Extinction. Uh, mass extinction. So ecological crisis. Quality of life the other right. Quality of life and, and technological advancements. We're also seeing an increase in human population, exponential increase in human population. So demographic challenges as well. Um, water challenges is huge. Food security is another big one. Um, out of all of them, though, I want to focus right now for our conversation on, on uh, what was said about energy crisis, which is um, peak oil. Uh, so this is, this is a fun one. So this is what happened 150 years ago when someone stuck a pipe in the ground in Pennsylvania. This the black stuff just came shooting out oil, and we figured out that it contained so much energy that we could build our entire industrial society on that. However, in the last 150 years, we've dug out, we've poked all the holes of the e easily available oil, and now we're moving on to harder and harder, so much so that we now have to build I learned that this cost, this oil platform cost $1.2 billion to build, drilling two miles underneath the ocean. There is no way we would go through this expense of building this kind of oil platform if we could still stick a pipe in the ground and get easily available oil. We've used up all the easily available fossil fuels. For scale, that's a person. Um, and we know that as we get, as we are going to every more extreme methods of extraction, that there can be consequences. This is the Gulf uh, Coast Deepwater Horizon oil spill. Um, and we're seeing this even affecting upstate New York. Um, this is right across the border in Pennsylvania, a hydro, hydraulic fracturing, hydro fracking, fracking uh, rig. Um, and we're seeing the consequences of having to go to extreme methods to satisfy our society's need for cheap energy. Um, basically, here would be a oil production curve if you uh, map it out, and it appears that we're right uh, potentially on the peak of a steep energy decline. Why does that matter? Well, uh, when you map it on a human or on a historic time scale, you see how just quick blip that it was. And, well, why should we be worried? Well, if you map human population on it, perhaps uh, we've been able to support a population like that because of um, subsidized fossil fuel agriculture. All right, so how, how many people are cheered up at this point? Okay, good. Um, so, but seriously, I think it's important for us to, to really take this in and to feel this, the pain that we feel when, when we hear this, uh, especially with those other crises, ecological crises, when you learn that 50% of all species of life on Earth may be extinct within our lifetimes. I think it's important for us to take in that pain and, for, and to feel it. And for me, it shows up as, as being afraid, as being angry. How could our parents have done this, feeling overwhelmed? What can we possibly do? Uh, and, and being afraid of what I may see in my lifetime. No generation has ever had to face this before, but we may actually be able to learn from previous generations that have had to face the prospect of nuclear devastation that might erase them from the planet. They also felt, and many in this room remember feeling the despair that came when you, you imagine the possibility that you might not be able to have children. So we can learn from that. and. And we can actually, there's been teachings out of that, that pain is our greatest teacher, that our suffering is not just our own suffering, but it's the suffering of the whole world. When we see clear-cut forests, when we see kids who could have had a good shot at life being thrown in jail in inner, in inner cities, when we see children losing parents, coral reefs bleaching, that's 
that's our pain. When we feel the anger, the sadness, the emptiness inside, that's the earth expressing itself through us, and we can own that. Uh, we, if we face reality with clear eyes and open heart, we can realize that we're not alone. You actually, despite knowing all of these things deep, deep in your uh, experience, you know all of this, you still showed up today. Look around you, in fact. See these amazing people sitting next to you that were born into the same critical moment that you were. And across the entire planet, there are young people coming of age at this crazy, crazy time with the same questions that you face of, what does this mean for my life? What am I going to do next? And that the possibility that every person sitting next to you will play a role in the healing of our world, and that we need each other, and that we will lead our world, our generation will lead the world through this time. And I am so grateful to be with all of you on this amazing hero's journey. <sighs> so before we move forward again, we have to know how we got here and, and to see things with new eyes. So we know that we are experiencing one of the greatest injustices, the greatest of injustices, um, where we are actively destroying the ecological foundations upon which civilization depends with the full knowledge that we're doing so. And why is that happening? Well, fundamentally, it's happening because we have had core assumptions that are incorrect. What are some of those assumptions that, has led it, that have led us to where we are today? The question. Yeah, it's, you know, the impacts of our actions are not, they're distant, they're not now. What else? There's no such thing as uh, our ability to change the world. We're not interconnected with the world. What else? Right. Oh, if we ignore it, it will just go away. That's a good one. One person can't make a difference. Uh, the core assumptions of everything that our, our modern society is built on is actually that there are no limits, that we can keep doing whatever we want, and that there will not be consequences to our actions. And that, fundamentally, all of everything that we're seeing right now is, comes from a fundamental assumption that we are separate, that we're separate from the world, that we're separate from each other. And, and that's actually, science is bearing out that that's actually just not true, that we're deeply interconnected connected all the way from co literally coming from a single point. Everything you see around you in the world came, all the people around you came from a single point. So if you ever don't know anyone, say, hey, I think I know you. Did we spend 15 billion years together as a singularity back before the Bing Bang? Um, that, that'd be great. That our bodies, that 90% of the DNA in our bodies is actually not human DNA. That the Earth is self-regulates. To keep optimum conditions for life, it behaves as if it's an organism uh, and if it's alive. Nature itself likes balance and uh, dynamic stability. We used to think that competition was the way that nature worked, and that's not true at all. Actually, s species c uh, work together through co cooperation uh, and to seek balance. The trees create seeds that the squirrel eats and then there uh, poops it out and then the tree is taken in again as uh, nutrients, everything's a cycle. And to live on this planet, all species have to play by those rules. But that's not how our economy works at all, right? How many people have seen Lord of the Rings? Right, yeah, yeah. So you remember the scene where it's like this down in the cave and they're digging stuff out, like this ancient stuff that they're pulling out of the ground. There's fire and brimstone. That's basically how our economy works, actually. Um, <laughs> but that's, that's, it doesn't have to be that way. Indigenous cultures have, especially here in, in upstate New York, the Haudenosaunee and the Finger Lakes region, had this concept. They understood that the impacts of their actions extend down to seven generations in the future. And in every deliberation, they must keep that in mind. So we can do the same thing. We have to view ourselves as a partner species in the community of life. So as we're building now, it's realizing that we can step forward. What is this new, exciting future uh, that we're going to be building together? What's it look like on the ground? What's it taste like, feel like? What, what, what are the colors? What are the images that you see? What's happening in your community already? What's, what's emerging? Sharing. Sharing. Smaller, we're coming, we're coming back to a, maybe a local community. What are we seeing in that local community starting to pop up? 
thrift. People are uh, actually reusing things. Local food movement. We're actually starting to grow our own food again. Amazing. A cycle. We're uh, reusing resources. The local economy is actually a cycle where instead of sending our money overseas paying for uh, oil, we're actually retrofitting our homes for energy efficiency, creating local jobs. What else? Okay, awesome. You, you got it. We're building all these exciting, amazing things are starting to pop up and emerge as a natural response to everything that we've uh, seen so far. So really, we have a choice. And that choice, each of us face this every day, is so we can either let all of this overwhelm us and use that as an excuse to do nothing, or we can see that we are part of the largest transition and change in human history. So, okay, great. Well, what do we do? Well, do what moves you. People are like, oh, well, how do I start? Well, find what motivates you. For me, it's about fairness and justice. That it's unfair that one generation can take away the ability of future generations to, to meet their needs. We're the ones inheriting this crisis. The, we're, we're the ones paying for it, and it's deeply um, unfair that the young people and the most vulnerable around our world are the ones going to face the impacts the most. Um, who here ever feels overwhelmed, by the way? OK. Look around you. Know that you're not alone and that your experience is being shared. In fact, I know you. I know each of you. You're the ones that get upset when you see someone getting bullied on the schoolyard. You're the ones that get upset when you see clear-cut forests. You feel that wrenching feeling in your own God, use that strength of yours to, to allow the earth to express through you what needs to happen. And if you don't express that, if you let it bottled up and you don't act on that and, and get that energy out there, it's going to stay there uh, inside of you. And it won't go away until you do. OK, cool. Um, Another one thing that I really like it, that's emerging at this time is the Occupy Wall Street movement, where just spontaneously people are coming together and being like, you know what? We actually want to take our future back. We want to take our country back. Let's do it. OK, let's do it. Bam. And they just all of a sudden it sparked this nationwide movement. Um, one thing I think is important uh, to, to talk about, well, uh, ignore that. Uh, so my story, in 2007, I was at my job, right? And I'm reading about the Arctic ice caps uh, back in 20, uh, that in 2100, there might not be an Arctic ice cap. And I'm like, what? How is that possible? And, and I learned that even if, there, if we went to 100% energy independence in my community, that we'd still get run over by climate change. So when I heard about the UN climate negotiations, that they would be deciding the future of the Kyoto Protocol at the, this place called Bali, I knew I just had to go. And so I went, um, and there were these young people. I saw young people from all around the world that cared about climate change, cared about being, building a better future, that at this, uh, from every language and culture, at this one event, we all got together from all around the world. And people would stand up and share what they're doing in each other's countries. So people would say, well, we're holding a youth power summit in, uh, in in the Adirondacks, or and then another country, the UK, would be like, well, you know, we met with half of member members of Parliament, and then the Australians stood up and they're like, oh yeah, well, we uh, we actually went into a coal plant and shut it down last month, and you're like, what? That's <laughs> awesome. And then uh, at the end of all of that, uh, a woman stood up in the back. Her name was Claire. You can kind of see her. And she stood up and she said, my name's Claire, and I'm from the island Kiribati in the Pacific. And my island is just a meter and a half above sea level. And we are already seeing the oceans rise and our beaches eroding. And my family and I, we are so afraid. And we don't know what we're going to do. We feel so alone. And she said, seeing all of you and hearing what you're doing, this is the first time that I felt not alone and that somebody cares. And everybody in the room started crying as we realized that we are here for something much, much larger than ourselves. And this was at the youth speech uh, where another Australian is calling out the country delegates that are blocking progress. Um, at the end, uh, Bamboo is standing right to the, the right there, eight years old. She stood up and read a poem that said, I'm simply here because I'm afraid my world will die. 
and the South African delegates were crying, and the German delegates were crying, and we realized that we as young people have the power to influence what is happening on around us. So I came back and uh, got together with some citizens uh, in Caroline, and we're like, what's the craziest thing we could do? Well, what if we deliver one energy-saving light bulb to every single household in the town of Caroline in a single day? No way. That will never happen. That's impossible. And then we got funded, and we're like, oh, no, we actually have to do this. So we organized 100 volunteers. It was a small team, very small team. 100 volunteers go to, went door to door and delivered one CFL in, in, uh, in a bag to every single household in the town of Caroline across 55 square miles in three hours the largest event of its kind in upstate New York history. And that has now spawned, talking about consequences of actions, that has now spawned uh, light, that was Lighten Up Caroline, it spawned Lighten Up Tompkins across six towns, and then Lighten Up Ithaca, which literally last week distributed 12,000 CFLs, one to almost every household in the city of Ithaca, at calculating that if every household uses the bulb that we gave them, we would save Ithaca over two-thirds of a million dollars in energy savings now recirculating in the local economy. That's what one small action can do when it sends its ripple effects out. Um, social change can be unexpected, and very small groups can have a huge impact. Did you know that actually only 3% of the population actively participated in the civil rights movement? Only 3%. And it had this huge impact that swept the nation. So uh, one of my favorite stories is this small group of people in, in DC and from actually around the country, young people, were like, you know what, we really have to do something on climate change. Let's have a summit right when um, the first 100 days of the Obama administration. And so they started calling their friends, and those friends started calling people, and the, the five grew to 50, which grew to 500. And pretty soon, they're, they're expecting to have 5,000 people show up at PowerShift. How many people have gone to PowerShift in DC? I highly, highly recommend it if you go, are able to go to the next one. It's every two years or so. So um, they wanted 5,000 people to show up on, you know, to call for climate change and clean energy. And guess what happened? 12,000 young people from around the country and the world showed up on the steps of the Capitol building. They didn't even know what to do. Uh, we organized 200 people from Tompkins County to go down. We were the second largest delegation in the nation. And it was just amazing, young people coming together, expressing our voices, showing up in a big way on the national scene. And we actually marched around the coal plant that powered, the dirty coal plant that powers the US Capitol building and we shut it down for a day. Pretty amazing. Um, even, even before we uh, got there, Nancy Pelosi announced that she was going to switch the fuel from coal to, to gas. Um, pretty cool. The, the 350, how many people have heard of 350, of course? Yes, great. Um, again, the largest day of international political action in history, 5,200 actions in 120, uh, sorry, 181 countries led by young people. It was even bigger in Copenhagen. Uh, there's the International Day of Action. Look at those cute kids. Uh, it was even larger in Copenhagen where uh, the, UN, the UN climate negotiations in 2009, 100,000 people marched, delivering the largest petition ever in the history of the world to government leaders, 15.2 million signatures. People, young people started getting arrested because they say, no longer, this is my future on the line and I cannot allow this to continue. And there were people that were fasting there, including Anna Keenan, who you saw pointing at the Bali climate negotiations. She started, she chose, I can't let this happen anymore, I'm gonna fast. And she fasted for 40 days and it inspired thousands of people around the world to join her, uh, myself included, for a day. Really amazing. So really, okay, great. You're all like, okay, that's all nice and good, but what do I do? I can't you know, jump on a plane and go to the UN climate negotiations. Um, well, you could try getting in someone's luggage. Well, how about try doing what you can with what you have where you are? And we've already learned in, in what I've said here that one action, just one action taken with clear intention can send ripple, out, ripple effects out that can literally change the world. We need to shoot for big dreams and big goals and to get, because that's what gets people excited. 
In fact, 99% of people are convinced that they are incapable of doing great things. And actually, that's exactly what Halliburton and ExxonMobil want you to think. That they want us to feel despair and to not do anything. They want us not to care. In fact, uh, while I was at Cancun, Bill McKibben, uh, at a panel discussion I was with, said, actually, um, this is about the, you know, the 10 largest corporations on the planet in the history of the world are energy, uh, of the 10, seven are energy companies, and the eighth is GE, and they spend tens of millions of dollars on propaganda for the public each year, and you probably see it on TV, manipulating public opinion. They have four lobbyists for every single member of Congress, and they don't have to pay for climate change. We do. They are profiting at our expense, and that's deeply unfair. And Bill McKibben said, and I quote here, actually what this boils down to is about everyday grassroots people mobilizing themselves against the dirty mass multinational energy corporations that just want to keep a good thing going for themselves for a few more years. So that's what it comes down to, really people who care. Okay, um, where are we? Okay, I wanted to tell a story, um, just ending with a, ending really with a story, which was, how does this, what can you do in your hometown? Well, in Caroline, we're an agricultural community. For 200 years, we've grown our, uh, grown our own food. We had mills powered by the waters of Six Mile Creek. Um, but over time, our town has changed, and it's farmers are, like many communities here, Farmers are having a harder time making a living. Uh, kids are moving out to bigger cities. Um, but at the same time, we're seeing folks moving in and actually have off-the-grid homes with advanced solar panels and wind technologies. So in that context, uh, four years ago, I was riding my bike home, to, uh, and I saw these orange flags on the side of the road. I'm like, I wonder what that's about. The answer came later that week when I was riding my bike to a council meeting and saw on the, the road, I was shocked that there were these caravan of giant white, shiny, unmarked trucks, huge trucks in a caravan driving on the side of the road. I'm like, what is going on? It, my first reaction was, this looks like in a corporate, multinational corporate invasion of my town. What the heck are they doing here? And the answer, uh, they, they actually, some of them had this round disc on the bottom, and I figured out that they were probably doing some kind of t seismic testing. And I was like, why are they doing that? The answer came a year later in the mail in the form of gas leases that were getting mailed to all of our um, community. And pretty soon, before, before we knew it, um, people said that we learned that 55% of the land was leased for gas drilling. And we're like, OK, you know, maybe, that's, maybe that could be cool. Um, but then we started hearing stories about uh, this, this new high volume, slick water, hydraulic fracturing, and then these horror stories of in other communities where you could set your water on fire and there was contamination and cows were dying. And we're like, what? This is going to come? No way. And people just started getting um, really, really uh, afraid. And in fact, they then published research from Cornell University came out that said, although they call it a clean transition fuel, natural gas, a methane gas, a clean transition fuel, it's with 60% cleaner burning. It actually, if you take into account the whole life cycle of all the trucks and the leaks, because methane is 100 times more powerful than CO2, it's actually greater than or equal to the, the carbon emissions of coal. And so we're like, people started despairing, like there nothing, that there's nothing that we could do. We were told that towns can't do anything about it. And literally five people in Caroline stood up and said, you know what, no, we are not going to allow this uh, activity in our community. We can do something about it. And they started organizing 40 volunteers to go door to door to every single house in Caroline multiple times, on, and they got 1,000 147 signatures on a petition, which was over half of all the registered voters in the town of Caroline. It was the largest petition in the history of Caroline, and they presented it to the town council. The town council, unfortunately, three of the members on there chose not to do anything about it. They just wanted to wait and see. They didn't want to lead. And so they started going back out to door to door to mobilizing people, and literally on Tuesday, we uh, ha elected an entire new town board in Caroline, two to one, victory two to one because people in Caroline 
wanted to stand up for a clean energy future and not a dirty energy future. And that started with five people saying, you know what, not in my town. The line is drawn here. We're going to start building that clean energy economy starting in our own hometowns and our own backyards. Yeah. So, so really the key is to t take an action, take any action, take small steps, get support, reach out to your buddies, celebrate every accomplishment that you have. Leverage your strengths. Try not, don't try spending lots of time on making yourself better, waiting until you're like a perfect person to save the world. No, no. Start now, work on your strengths. And youth is our strength. Um, people under 25 are the most powerful force uh, on this planet. We just look at Egypt and what's happened by toppling uh, a, a despot that's been there for decades just by being in the streets, young people coming together, leveraging their strengths. Um, three things, hold actions, create new structures, and shift in consciousness. If we can do all of those things, uh, we can ignite a movement. Um, just last week, <laughs> We are, our movement is creating this space for the world that we want to see brought into being. Just last week, I went down to DC and joined uh, an action where we were joining hand in hand around the White House, where to stop a pipeline that would take dirty, uh, damaging coal from Alberta, Canada, literally through America's heartland to the Gulf Coast to process more oil, when we already know what the consequences of that will be. And people all along the route of that pipeline are saying, you know what, no, not in my backyard. This is not OK. And it's actually an international movement because people in Canada, uh, First Peoples Nations here in the US, and uh, environmentalists and activists here are joining together saying, we don't want this carbon bomb anymore. And so we joined around. The linking hands around the White House. I was expecting just to um, be, you know, one person deep. There were five people deep all the way around the White House, completely surrounding it, sending a powerful message to Obama. Yeah, you 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 better listen to this emerging movement that's happening here. Um, through our actions, we can set in motion uh, powerful things. I'm going to end with one story, and that's Felix Finkbeiner. Who has heard of Felix Finkbeiner? Okay. So Felix, he grew up in Germany. He's 12 years old. And he, uh, when he first learned about climate change he, for, on a book report, his teacher said, OK, go home, learn about climate change, come back and give a book report. He's reading about climate change. He's just like, oh my goodness, this is, ah, we have to do something. So he's standing up there giving his book report, report to the class. And he just kind of spontaneously, you know, this courage comes up. And he's like, we, we should plant a million trees. And they're all like, uh, OK, um, yeah, sure, that's nice. And they, but they form a club, and they started getting people around it. And they started actually planting trees in their local area, and then starting, starting clubs at other schools. Uh, again, 12 years old, other schools. And they start um, you know, training people. They start having nationwide trainings coming in from all around the country. And just this past year, they planted their millionth tree. And I was at the UN climate negotiations in Copenhagen, and, and sorry, in Cancun, in Mexico, and where I in, in Carmen del Playa, which is a, a, a city right on the sea, I had the opportunity to see him now 14 years old, talking with uh, the equivalent of our boy and girl scouts, who were ranged in age from three years old, so adorable in their little costumes, all the way to uh, graduating seniors from high school. And he was talking about how if we don't take action on climate change, everything that you see here will be underwater. Your parents' homes will be underwater. We have to do something. And that starts with us as young people taking our own future into our own hands. And he asked, so this is all through a translator, and he asked, will you join me and plant a million trees in your country too? And they all kind of talked with each other. And then with one voice, they said, yes, yes, we, we will do that. We choose to do that. And the incredible thing is he's traveled all around the world. And now 81 other countries, their young people, have signed on to planting a million trees each. That started with one person and one 12-year-old in a creative, courageous moment in his classroom with a clear intention, sending ripple effects out that are literally changing this world. So imagine if one 12-year-old can plant 80, 
one million trees, what we are all collectively capable of doing. Thank you so much. I believe in you. We're going to do this together. I trust you so much. Thank you. Thank you.